Markle vs. Markle, the Channel 7 Spotlight Special that I viewed last night and I'd like to share with you my impressions of it and how I felt uh, during and after I watched it. Now I want to kick off with actually the end of it because it's Thomas Markle talking to Liam Bartlett one-on-one -on -one, and I want to read you direct quotes from what he said and to tell you the truth, I have tried to record the start of this video about four times and I'm not saying that for dramatic effect, but I keep getting teary and choked up. And so I'll just go ahead now and read you a direct quote of what he said and then I'll take you back so that you get the context of the whole thing and then see what you think. So the direct quote from Thomas Markle at the end of the interview was, now be aware that he speaks in quite a stilted way because he has had a stroke and it has affected his speech. He says, what's wrong? How can I fix this? Of course, I love you. And Harry, nice guy, I love you for marrying my daughter. Meg, I love you. Love my grandchildren. <laughs> it's getting to me again. I'd love to see them and I'm open to any kind of conversation. And then he looks at Liam Bartlett and he says, thank you. Oh, I just, oh I'm so sorry. But it really affected me because when you saw this at the end, not so much during the whole thing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not so much during the whole thing, but because there you've got Samantha Markle being quite angry and you've got John Jr., you know, with his his anger too, which is just normal sort of sibling anger because they're angry at the way their father's being treated. But when Thomas Markle said that at the end of the interview, it was so heartfelt and so sincere and it doesn't really matter what's gone before uh, or what's been said or what hasn't been said. I think love cuts through all the BS. And so I really hope they can find a way back to each other, you know. It was just heartbreaking. And I was sitting, <laughs> this is hopeless. I was sitting on the couch with my 19 year old son watching this and I probably that's why I'm so emotional because I was imagining if I was estranged from my child and how devastating that would be and so I'm not paying him any attention I'm just writing notes for you guys and sort of you know trying to get this done so I could make this video today and this bit at the end just cut through me taking notes and I just really teared up and I looked to my son and I've asked his permission to tell you this I looked to my son and I said oh that really got to me that made me cry and he looked back at me and he had tears in his eyes now he's a big burly tough 19 year old <laughs> I seldom see him with glissy eyes and he looked back at me and said that's so sad mum so you know, if you get a chance to see this, you know, I think I really think that anyone with a heart will uh, feel the same way. And uh, so I'm going to recover a bit and I'm going to come back and just take you through the rest of the interview in a sensible and unemotional way. So Liam Butler was the interviewer, like I said, and the uh, it opened with uh, footage of Megan being homecoming queen and it was quite sweet and she was on the back of a car with I guess I don't I'm not American so I don't know what they call the male equivalent of a homecoming queen a homecoming king I don't know um, and they were on the back of this car and they went past I think they were going around a sports oval it looked like and she spotted her dad in the crowd and she goes hi daddy and she was so happy and proud and he was filming her and that was this film that that it opened with. And through the conversation after showing that film, 
Um, Thomas Michael said, well, you know, every chance we got where I wasn't working, we used to go and do things together. You know, we, we, he would take her to the snow or he'd take her fishing or he, you know, they were always going off on adventures together. And he said that from the sixth grade, Megan lived with him. So he saw her all through high school and all through college. And they were incredibly, incredibly close. And I believe it. You know, it's just so obvious in all the little clips they showed and the way he spoke about her. Now, I'm just going to share another quote from uh, Thomas Markle. Uh, He said, I spent a lot of my life with her. I don't know how she can throw it all away. Um, now, Tom Jr. and Samantha's main role in this show it was to uh, defend and, and protect him. Actually, it was incredibly moving too because Samantha Markle lives in Florida and her dad lives in Mexico and John Jr. lives just up the road from his dad. So he's his dad's sort of, he cares for his dad. So there's a lot of love between son and dad. Uh, There's a lot of love between Samantha and her father, but they hadn't managed to see each other for a very long time. And this program brought them together. And when Thomas Markle came in on his walking stick, you know, because the effects of the stroke are really significant, um, Samantha Markle was in her wheelchair, so it's not as if she can get up and run to him. So he came to her and they hugged and she started crying and, they had a little sort of whispered thing and he was saying, do you all right? And, and oh, you know, like the, the love is real. It's there. And that was moving as well. And um, but throughout this sort of show, Samantha has a cold glinting fury in her eye, which only a sister can have for a sibling that they think is misbehaved, but she made some really, really good points. And I want to quote a few things from Samantha. Uh, I, I wrote here, these are my notes, Samantha is angry with her. She is a staunch defender of their dad and the fury about his treatment shines in her eyes and colors everything she says. That was the note I wrote while I was watching. Now, this is a direct quote from Samantha. She iced our father. So the impression I got was that Thomas was iced out of the picture from the very early stage in Harry and Meghan's relationship. Now, Samantha has a theory on that. She has a theory that uh, she didn't want the royal family to meet her family, not just because maybe she was ashamed of them, but because if her father in particular met the royal family, it would make the what Megan said about her childhood ring to be untrue. Uh, Samantha thinks that she had exaggerated things to get sympathy and to sort of ingratiate herself with the royal family and that these uh, untruths and exaggerations would become apparent upon meeting her family and that's why Megan was trying to avoid um, her family meeting the royals prior to the wedding. She also makes a really interesting point that she says that she thinks that Meghan lacked confidence herself and that was why she felt the need to inflate everything. And she said all she really needed to do was say, look, I came from an upper middle class family. My dad worked really hard and sacrificed me to send me to good schools and to put me through college and and I'm really grateful for that and um and Samantha also makes the point that when those awful paparazzi shots of Thomas Markle appeared in the paper she said that he was really embarrassed in front of his old work colleagues because as you know he was an Emmy award-winning lighting director he worked very hard he was on a good income Um, He wasn't a loser by any stretch of the imagination, but these awful pap shots were of, as Harry, they played a bit from Harry's book Spare in the doco, and it was the thing that Harry said, and there was Meg's father every time he picked up the paper with his belly hanging over his belt or carrying beer, or and it, it was very sneery and derisive, and 
On hearing it back in the context of seeing this family, I'm wondering whether Meghan felt the pressure from Harry to exclude her father because, I mean, Harry doesn't qualify the fact that, you know, how unfair that is. I mean, how many of us going off to the laundromat or going off to buy some beer? What's wrong with going off to buy a few beers? He only had two or three in a bag. I mean... I mean, he wasn't carrying a carton. A carton is what we say in Australia where you've got like 24 or something. I mean, he only really had a few beers in a plastic bag that he bought at the shop. I mean, so what? And he had, uh, you know, his belly was showing over his belt, but maybe the poor man had put on some weight through his health difficulties because he obviously found it quite hard to get around and maybe he hadn't had time or or the desire to go and shop for new clothes. Maybe he he had financial cons- constraints and so he was wearing clothes that were a little bit too small and he didn't he'd probably expect to get photographed when he went off to the shops. I mean, if someone photographed me walking my dog at six o'clock in the morning, it's scary. It's scary. I look dreadful. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be photographed. So that was why Thomas Markle did the stupid thing with the set up photographs because he thought that that would be put out and that he would look better. And he did. And also, this is just personal opinion, but when he appeared on inter- for interviews and, you know, he was bellowing into the wind He was embarrassed. He was trying to get his daughter back. He was trying to get his daughter's attention. By that stage, Megan had sent him that letter and he had, he says in this documentary, no way of getting back to her. But like I said, John Jr. and Samantha come across as more disgruntled, not as quite heartfelt, um, which I said is a typical sort of sibling reaction. But I thought it was really interesting that Samantha said that about, you know, that Megan, she thinks Megan felt the need to inflate herself because she wasn't feeling as confident as she made out. So let's get back to the notes because um, I don't want it to be all about what I think and my reaction. So they have a barbecue uh, with the journalist Liam Butler present and it looks all you know where they've probably filmed earlier during the day and they seem to have lightened up a little bit and it was said in a light-hearted way at the barbecue but there was pot shots at Harry okay where Thomas Markle said that well a bit bewildered it was more bewildered than malicious and I'm not making excuses for him it really came across as a bit bewildered he said no matter how bad or stupid the things he did so he acknowledges that um, he says he's never played naked pool or dressed as a Nazi (laughs) and it was you know it was a light-hearted family barbecue moment it was said with laughter and like I said bewilderment. I wrote here in my notes, bewilderment, not malice. But then Thomas, uh, later in the interview, he said so many poignant things. You could tell that he was really trying to make a difference with this interview. Now, Tom Mar- Thomas Markle says he was sitting on the couch, Samantha one side, John Jr. and the other, and he says, is it worth it? He's talking to Megan. Is it worth it? Is it worth being away from me for the rest of my life? And there was clear implication through the whole doco that, you know, the end of his life was maybe not too far away. I mean, he's had a devastating stroke. Denying my grandchildren. Is it worth all of that? Is it worth getting rid of her father. Then he gets a little angry and gets some energy back and he says, I refuse to be buried by her. So he swayed back to, you know, some strength. Um, And when you look at this documentary, you can see it's not worth it. (laughs) It's not worth it. The royal family, it's okay. So you married a prince in the royal family. It, it, you know, heightened you to global fame or infamy (laughs) and now everyone knows your name and it's not worth it. You can see that they had a relationship 
And he actually said, we were very close. I spent the majority, you know, of my time with her when he wasn't working. And he said, uh, I was her hero. Now, dads know if they're the little girl's hero. And he was a hero to Megan for a very long time. I get the impression And then he says, how can she just throw that away? He he can't understand it. He said, I just want to go with her somewhere quiet and talk it out, work it out. And I, I believe him and I really, really hope that happens. And uh, I'm going to come back and tell you about the rest of the spotlight Uh, is special because they actually then transfer to London and they talk about the coronation, they talk to Angela Rippon, they talk about Diana and Charles's marriage and how all that came about. There's some astounding things said and there's a little bit, silly bit on Andrew that I have no idea why it wasn't edited out. Okay, so they then switch to London and the excitement about leading up to the coronation and Angela Rippon is interviewed and she's taken on, it looks like a London black cab ride uh, on the coronation route and she makes a really interesting point. She says that Charles, King Charles III, all his life, whenever he's travelled this route to an important state event, he's been behind his mother and that the applause and the people lining the streets uh, have been for her. And she makes the point that this is probably, well, this is the first time officially in like a huge state event that uh, it's him. He's the main focus. And I thought, yes, yes. But a really interesting part was they were talking about sort of all the troubles in Charles' life and how the focus on his life has been more about the fractious sort of relationships that he's had. Um, And it's true. And they say about uh, their marriage and they they do emphasise that pretty much Diana and Charles' marriage was was an arranged marriage and that Diana was in love with Charles but fully aware that it was pretty much an arranged marriage. And Angela Rippon, and I'm sorry, I don't know the other interviewer, were interviewing the engaged couple and they tossed a coin to see who got to say either the first words to them or the last words to them. And she won the coin toss. So she got to finish the interview. She got to say the last words. And she said to them, well, I just, you know, we all wish you well. We hope you will be very happy along those lines. And Charles just lit up. They showed the clip. He just lit up all sort of boyishly excited and happy. And he just spontaneously, it wasn't fake, just looked at Diana like excited. And it was lovely. It was a lovely look. And Diana wouldn't look at him and just look down at the floor. And Angela Rippon said, it was really, I didn't know it at the time, but she said, now I know that Diana at that point, at that time, wanted out. But then they interviewed Ingrid Seward, who uh, was editor of Majesty magazine, I believe. She came out with a bombshell, made me want to do the Oprah, what? She said that she spoke to Diana just before she died And she said that Diana said to her that it wasn't Camilla that broke up the marriage. And Ingrid's went, Diana, you're blowing my mind. Like, what are you saying? This is crazy. What? You know, what? And uh, Diana said, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Camilla that broke up our marriage. It was all the other people around us that broke up our marriage. And then, of course, Diana had you know, the the accident and died. And I don't know if Ingrid ever came out and said this publicly before because I haven't ever heard it before. But uh, I don't see why she had any reason to lie. She was close to Diana. She was, you know, Diana featured in Majesty magazine a lot. Um, I don't think that Ingrid Seward was particularly on Charles and Camilla's side or anything. So, yeah, I, I 
think she was very genuine. I think she was telling the truth in this interview and that was so surprising to me. And so they did the Andrew thing. And so they sort of alluded to the nefarious allegations and they had sort of a shadowy photo of him. I'm no Andrew fan. I've done a video about that Emily Maitlis interview. I deconstruct it uh, very in detail. And I'm going to put that up post-coronation because I don't want to kill the vibe. I, I, I will do that post-coronation. It's already recorded. I'll put it up and see what you think. Um, so, you know, they did that. And then they uh, interviewed Lady Victoria Harvey, who's a known really close ally and friend of Prince Andrew. And she basically says nothing other than she's a friend and she believes he's telling the truth and she feels really sorry for him and he's really depressed and he needs to get back out there. And I'm thinking, well, no, no, he doesn't need to get back out there, Lady Victoria Harvey. We're all fine with him retired riding horses. Leave it. Uh, personal opinion. Uh, but then she's asked, to, you know, well, what exactly was your relationship with Prince Andrew? And she said, I'm not prepared to talk about that on camera. So, and then it just cut away from that and the program pretty much ended. So I, look, they should have left that on the cutting room floor. floor. It was a load of rubbish and it was a pity because it ended the, the very good show on a bit of a meh, note. So that's my take of the whole thing. Uh, like I said, I hope you get to see it. Apologies for my emotion at the start of the video, but I have decided to leave it in because it's true. It was my reaction. And so I probably shouldn't try to cover it up. I should just leave it in and um, I'll probably get slammed in the comments, but that's okay. Thank you. Until next time. Bye-bye.